So first of all, um, also from my side, thanks um, all for participating. My name is Michaela and I'm facilitating from Germany. So let me introduce you to Maketa. Maketa Pavlikova. She has graduated from mathematical statistics and um, she obtained a master's um, of science in biostatistics in Belgium. Um, she has worked as a data analyst and a researcher, and I'm sure the rest she will tell um, you yourself, herself. So um, just uh, two quick things. Um, Maketa will um, start presenting, and um, in between she will ha already ask the participants um, for um, uh, for um, question for discussion. So we will facilitate that and I'm sure um, it would be great um, if you could participate in this discussion. Thank you. So over to Maketa. Uh, hello everyone uh, and welcome from the Czech Republic. Uh, as Michaela kindly introduced me, uh, I'm a biostatistician and I will, I'm a mother of four girls and I'm a birth right activist. I'm also a member of government counseling body, uh, which is a lot of work and uh, hope for a little impact. Uh, and uh, I will speak about the role of, um, of, of the situations when uh, situations around birth and uh, emergency services meet and what are the needs of all people around. Uh, I'm from the Czech Republic, which is a little country in the middle of Europe, and uh, you may know it from the uh, International Congress of Midwives that was held in Prague two years ago. Uh, and I want to briefly introduce you into the situation of, of midwifery in the Czech Republic. Uh, you, may, you may have seen on the map that we are just on the border between the Western Europe and the older uh, Soviet Empire, so uh, it's easily to be understood that the midwifery was quite suspended for 40 years here. Uh, midwives were renamed uh, gynecology or women nurses, and they got really medically oriented nursing education. Uh, by now, there is uh, quite few uh, independent, continuity of care oriented midwives. Uh, they really count in tens. Uh, and uh, they face uh, unsurmountable legal obstacles to assist childbirth outside hospital settings. Most of the midwives are now inside hospital, and they are bound to accept hospital policies, uh, which is okay, but also subordination to obstetric, uh, obstetrics uh, decision, uh, and this is required. They cannot act by themselves unless the OB decides. Uh, so most childbirths are now obstetrician-led. Uh, there is also a strong regional component. There is a, uh, one region in the Czech Republic where the childbirths are more midwife-led. They have a good tradition in uh, well allowing midwives uh, leading, leading childbirths. And the interesting things, and quite logical is that this is the region with the least caesarean section. So it quite uh, uh, corresponds to findings that when midwives are uh, in play, uh, the caesarean sections are much lower than in other regions. Uh, okay, uh, because because uh, as I spoke, most most childbirths they uh, are held in the hospitals and led by obstetricians. And because of these uh, obstacles, you can see on this little map uh, that uh, home birth face very uh, difficult situations here. Uh, in the red, well, we are also in red, and these are these are the countries from Europe where midwives face fines for attending uh, home births. Uh, never, uh, well, it never happened by now, but the law is there, and uh, where. Uh, Midwives have to be very careful if they if they assist it and assist it really uh, in clandestine way. So it's not really a good situation. Uh, and now for the emergency, which is the which is the question we are tackling here, we have quite wide network of emergency services. Uh, there are 14 regions, regional uh, networks which which are connected, 
and uh, it's mandated by law that uh, the emergency service, the emergency ambulance, has to arrive in 20 minutes from co from the call. So, uh, and it, in, in the big big cities, uh, it's really done like that. Uh, it's maybe even less. It, it may be even 10 minutes, and they really try hard to make it 20 minutes in the country regions. Uh, most of the cases are paramedic assisted, and there is a part of the of the cases of the calls which are medical doctor assisted. It's uh, somewhere between 10 and 25 percent of calls. Uh, so now I want to speak about some cases uh, which happened in the Czech Republic, and uh, where the uh, around childbirth and when there was some uh, emergency calls and it resulted in a situation that wasn't standard and how, how, how it was tackled. Uh, our first case is a case that happened about six years ago. There was an unplanned, unassisted childbirth of a third child and the woman who uh, had very bad experience from previous uh, uh, childbirth in hospital, she delayed transfer, uh, well, she didn't tell his, her husband, let's go to the hospital, and she stayed until it was too late. So she gave birth to a healthy boy, and one hour after birth, because the parents were not prepared to give birth uh, unassisted, they were quite confused about ho what to do with the cord, because the baby was still attached to the cord, and uh, by that time there was really little information uh, for normal women what to do with the lotus birth or with the baby who is still attached to the placenta. So they called for emergency service. Uh, service arrived, uh, medical doctor uh, who arrived at the service because there was a newborn concerned, checked the baby, said the baby is okay, and as usual he said, okay, let's go to the hospital. And now the problem arrived because the woman decided, well, I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm here, my baby is okay. Uh, you said the baby is okay, so we are staying at home. And this was a very uh, new situation for the, for the doctor and for the whole emergency uh, team because they are used to women who really say, oh, please take me to the hospital. So, uh, so they really tried hard to find a reason why to transfer the baby. And uh, they were in so much stress that they called for police assistance and forced transfer on the woman and on the baby. Uh, because this happened in February and there was a minus 15 degrees below freezing point. The baby, who was not wrapped in the tin foil, uh, was, uh, arrived hypothermic to the hospital and had to stay for two days separated from, uh, from his mother. So the mother asked emergency services for an apology. and. Uh, the original organization declined the apology and said it was all fault of the mother if she accepted the transfer on the first, uh, the baby would be okay. So mother sued uh, in civil case emergency services for a harm that was done to her and to her baby. And the, uh, and the court decision uh, was uh, okay, emergency services have to pay mother for the harms, but the next court said, no, 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 the doctors have, uh, are always right. It was certainly good to transfer the baby. And so, so it, there is a uh, five years lasting uh, court ping pong. And now I was, uh, I was uh, asked for a statement for the, uh, for the court how the situation is in other countries. Uh, so i asking a question how this situation would really be handled it in your country. Here, really, what was underlying the transfer was the fear of the doctor who arrived that he's not fully qualified as a neonatologist who is a normal person who examines the baby in the hospital. And this is really a situation that uh, uh, is complicated for midwives here. It also complicates the situation for midwives here because there is a high specialization uh, of, uh, of the care. Uh, the babies are delivered, as, we, as, as they say, by obstetricians, and then there is a neonatologist every time present uh, at the childbirth who checks the baby. So they are not, 
these are not midwives who are taking care of the newborn babies. And so even the normal doctors who are not specialized in neonatology really have fear to decide whether the baby is all right. So please, uh, is there any opinion from your side how this would be handled in your country? Would, the, would there be a forced transfer or would it happen more smoothly? The baby was uh, all right by the time um, the, the emergency service arrived, uh, and it was even declared by the medical doctor. And he only tried to find for the uh, for the excuse for the transfer. So his first excuse was, "Oh, the baby was attached for one hour to the placenta, so he can bleed to the placenta." But uh, apparently, it was just uh, uh, he, he was trying to find this answer in discussion with his peer in the hospital, and the baby was apparently okay in the in the room. And just uh, just after the transfer, he was found hypothermic. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think the baby was uh, was put skin to skin with his mother in this one hour after childbirth when they were at home. So uh, in the, in the uh, medical record, it's written the baby is on his mother's chest and is uh, is latched, is uh, is suckling. Okay, thank you. And would they require some uh, some against to sign something like against medical advice or something like that? Okay, thank you. It's really important because uh, these are the situations that are quite new for people uh, in emergency services here. Like there is, a, we estimate there is about between 500 and 1,000 home birth, planned home birth every year. Uh, but of course, the emergency services are called to only a very small proportion of the cases, and they, there is always a big conflict and more and big insecurity how to handle these situations. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, in America they would require a signature. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Robin. I think this is really very intensely connected to the main situation that there is. But it, this was not midwife, but this was unassisted. So maybe I understand that if the midwife is there. But if uh, if the if there is an assisted childbirth, they would also uh, respect mother's wishes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If, if anyone else from other countries than New Zealand, uh, USA, or Australia would like to uh, put their opinion. Is this a question, Michaela? Is this a question for me or for the others? <laughs> no, it's for you. It, it was just, I, I was, it's a personal okay. question I want to ask yes. you. Uh, well, uh, theoretically, yes. And uh, this law, but, but not by the time. Actually, uh, the law uh, for, for defining midwives is here since 2012, and this happened in 2010. So, so not by the time. But, but it, this was real, really unassisted childbirth. Of course, now there are a lot of childbirths which are assisted, but. Uh, Midwives leave the scene before the emergency service arrives because of the fear of the fine. The situation is really, really bad in that uh, in that respect now. So, and there are some midwives that stay with the woman even between, uh, when the transfer happens, but they really can be prosecuted. They were never prosecuted so far, but uh, as the law is really set to instill fear into midwives, this was really the purpose of the law. So, well. Oh, Combination of different legal legal uh, sets or legal, different laws, so uh, so they uh, they can face fine, but never did so far. 
Yes. Yes, I think so. That that the situ uh, thank you, Ivana. I think the situation is really that the way that uh, uh, they are really uh, very. Uh, they have fear that they never saw actually childbirth, and I know that uh, when they are um, educated in emergency services, that ho that birth is always considered a highly risky situation for the emergency team. So they really always fear when they are called to childbirth. Yes, thank you, Crystal. Yeah, I think so. That we are quite similar in some respects to the USA and the situation in Czech Republic. Also, the OBs in Czech Republic are very, uh, well, the, they consider US OBs as their most closest peers. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Linda. Yeah, I think we shall move because there is uh, much more to discuss. Uh, so I'm going to to talk about, uh, but you can you can write still in the chat. I will certainly read it. Uh, so let's go to the next case, which is clearly connected with this one, because now I will speak about the situation of the midwife under this under these regulations and under. Uh, and what are the fears of the government in the situation? The childbirth uh, at home would be uh, 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 would be uh, accommodated into our system. Uh, I was also an expert, uh, and I give my statement and Dubska and Krasova case in the European Court of Human Rights. You may have hear, uh, heard about it. It's a case of two women who were declined. Uh, assistance at childbirth with the midwife uh, when they wanted to give birth at home. So they sued the Czech Republic that the system doesn't allow midwives legally to assist. And they took the case to the European Court of Human Rights because it's a right uh, for a, a part of the family, family rights to decide on the place of the birth of the baby. And the Czech Republic says, OK, you can give birth anywhere they, you want, but uh, you cannot ask uh, medical or the uh, professional assistance whenever, uh, wherever you want to give birth. And the recurring argument, among others, there are plenty of arguments the, the government is, uh, is putting, but we are now speaking about emergencies. So the recurring argument is, if we allowed childbirth, um, home birth in our country, we, are, we would need to modify the emergency system to include the possible transfer, and it would be excessively costly. And you may, you may be really surprised at the situation, because uh, I presume, and from what I heard from other countries, that the, uh, this, the, the transfers from home births are really not different from the transfers just in case of uh, uh, of stroke or uh, uh, some heart problems, etc. Uh, and even now, as, the, as I remind you, the Czech system ensures 20-minute arrival time. And even by now, 10% of birthing women call EMS because, well, this is true, uh, a lot of people here really uh, take advantage of this wide net of emergency services and they just call uh, the women just call, they want to transfer to the hospital. They don't, uh, the taxis are not really used and people, uh, well, take their own cars, but uh, usually, but they're like 19 percent, but 10 percent of women which get usually in panic because the labor starts and they were instructed by the OBs, oh, yeah, when the labor starts, you should get immediately to the hospital. So the culture is the, uh, the birth is something very dangerous, and it has to be done in a really confined or a hospital environment. So a lot of people really just call out of fear. And so only about, so by now, for 10% of women, which is like 10,000 cases a year, are attended by emergency services. Uh, and about 1% uh, of birthing women, which means 10,000 uh, a year, are attended by MDs in this kind of uh, a system. So uh, so it's very funny to say that it would be excessively costly, because uh, as we estimated, when the, if the child birth, if the home birth was included in the system, it would be like from 50 to 100 cases a year of a 
urgent home birth transfers. And so would we, uh, what I make out of it, that the probable reasons they think that there should be a special treatment of transfers from home birth is that strong disbelief that midwives at home birth are able to handle the situation before the woman or the baby is taken care of in the hospital. So uh, as someone pointed out in the discussion, this is really strongly related to the uh, to the uh, uh, globe to the uh, to the perceiving to, to perceivement of midwives and midwives role as usually the midwives are perceived as being subordinated to uh, to OBs and they are educated in that way they are not educated uh, to be autonomous people with autonomous autonomous decision so uh, the idea that midwife would be taking care of the woman and the, or the baby during transfer seems really unacceptable to uh, to the people who are making health policies here, and this is also uh, also en uh, enforced by something we call Netherlands Ambulance Whip. Uh, it appeared in the print uh, some ten years ago, and it's recurring in the discussions around home birth. And it is said that, okay, but in, in the countries when home birth is allowed, there is always a fully equipped ambulance with an OB or a neonatologist waiting outside the house where the home birth takes place. So you may say this is very funny because, uh, like, uh, if, the, if the transfer is needed, like in 5 to 10 percent of cases, be a really waste of money and a waste of time of specialized people, but this uh, this myth is perpetuated uh, in the press and among people. And what really surprised me, I found it once in an article from I think Malaysia about home births. So it's not only Czech specified myth, but probably some OBs just perpetuated on their conferences, or I don't know. So, uh, my question now and the point for the discussion, how is the urgent transfer of care organized in your country? Is there some uh, special amendment to transfer from home birth or is just the normal part of the, of the transfer system? And also, there is, was, uh, as far as I know, one time, I think in Aachen, in Germany, there were uh, independent and autonomous midwives that were usually doing their own business, but they were on call to assist unplanned home births, which I found very, very interesting and very, very good thing that even women who are not uh, planning home birth, but they are found in need of, a, of a professional assistance, uh, if it surprises them at home, there would be a midwife and not just the regular medical doctor who is trained in other types of emergencies. So does this service exist somewhere else? Yes, Linda, thank you. We are trying to educate the women, <laughs> really. And uh, the movement is uh, getting quite a momentum now, but it's getting momentum for for last 20, 50 years. But I think that with the spread of social media, the information is spreading quite fast. So there is a lot of women really now uh, wanting to, even in the hospitals, to uh, wanting lots of birth, which is really disputed, but at least uh, uh, they they discuss delayed cutting of cords and things, and this is also part of the policy they are trying to, to introduce, to really understand the meaning of informed consent, which is not really easy, because, uh, like, okay, informed consent and those things about uh, rights in biomedicine really stemmed out, out of, uh, in the West, from the Western culture, and it was quite, let's say, forced on Czech medical doctors, uh, but really doesn't stem from their, uh, from their education and from their traditions and from what they did during the times the communist regime was here. 
Yes, yes, I know, and that's what, uh, yes, I know about uh, the, the transfers from home births are not usually emergency transfers. Uh, that, uh, that's what, uh, we, may, we, we may discuss this, but I, uh, I think in Germany it's about 1.5% uh, of urgent transfers before birth, uh, about 3% after birth. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Robin. This is this is from UK. Uh, I cannot see. I cannot see. In New Zealand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the specialized neonatal retriever team is specialized. Uh, is it from hospital or is it from the emergency services? Sheila, this is which country, please? Um, uh, thank you, Robin. Yes, okay. So this is the hospital team that just get, gets alerted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a good, this is a good uh, organization. Yeah. So, so just the basic services, but there is a, there is a possibility for the, for the hospital team to be ready for transfer. Uh, actually, I, uh, as far as I know, there is a specialized neonatology ambulance in, for the, but I, I'm not sure if it's the part of the emergency service or the, or the hospital service, but certainly there is a quite a lot of, uh, of preemies, for example, who need transfer from small hospitals to bigger hospitals, so there are specialized ambulances. And I think that they can be easily incorporated even to the situation of home birth. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Yes. And th that's what I think, that it can be easily, like the system already exists, we have also a helicopter service in em for emergency cases. And it can be easily accommodated to the needs of home birth. Actually, there was one case two years ago when the woman was breathing heavily after home birth, and so she was transferred by helicopter, and everything went well and, and finished well. Thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. So, actually, uh, if you agree with me, uh, it's quite easy to incorporate it in the existing system just by the education, not by financial, extra finance uh, in equipment or in staffing. Thank you, Sheila. Okay, so, so yeah, okay. Makata, I just wanted to remind you on the time. Okay, so we have 15 minutes to the end. Okay, I'm closing discussion now on this, or you can still type, and I will read it later, and uh, you can, okay? And I continue just uh, to show you some data, because as I'm a biostatistician, I need to show you some data. <laughs> and uh, certainly, uh, this, uh, this presentation will be available on my pages, and I post it also on the Facebook uh, of the conference. So you can uh, check the, uh, if you are interested in the data, you can check the, um, uh, the links later. And these are just um, to get an idea how many urgent transfers happen during, uh, during, the, uh, uh, during home births. And it's about, as you can see, about 1 to 5% to, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, home births. And this uh, later one is not from this systematic review, but it comes from a new study uh, by Hutton in, uh, in Ontario, and they had about 8% uh, percent of transfers by EMS. And so and these are also some interesting studies and, uh, which give details about, about transfers. And now for the role of the midwife, uh, because always, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I clicked, this, this is the, this is the correct one. Uh, midwife can be, uh, in a case of the, of the transfer, she can be, uh, she usually is on the delivering side because she's transferring her client 
with or without continuing her care. Or she can be even on the receiving side if she's a hospital midwife. So I think every midwife should think, uh, should think about how to handle the transfer. I, on, on, on each side, she can, she can happen to be. And is it can be expected that uh, if you are practicing autonomous midwife and you have clients and you give uh, your services outside hospital setting, you can expect that 5 to 10 percent will need really urgent emergency contact and maybe an extra 10 to 20 percent will need to be transferred to the hospital. So I think it's very important uh, to think about the, about the situation and to be prepared for the situation because the, the, the transfer is always stressful. There is a really good uh, text by Cheney uh, which considered uh, different uh, narratives of the risk and fear and of how to handle the transfer. In the, it was from the United States. And there are also other studies from Netherlands and Sweden and other countries that discuss the, the situation of the transfer. And uh, the, the, the cost, it's stressful because the cost is stressful. If the baby is in need or the woman is in need and, and it's really considered urgent, so everyone is stressed out. And the transfer itself is stressful because there were some plans to give birth to the home and now the plans are changing, so everyone is stressed and even just because of the, of the transfer and of the discontinuing of care and trying to continue the other type of care in the hospital. And the outcome is often stressful. Uh, it is well known that if uh, already the urgent situation arrives, that the outcomes are not as good as it is in average from the home birth. So it's very, very important to take all these things in consideration and think about what can help in the situation. And I think the most important thing is a good communication uh, between all the, all the um, people involved in the transfer. It's, uh, it's the, you have, the, the midwife has to, has to really communicate with the woman before and after the, the transfer uh, happened. And uh, there is a need of good communication between the midwife and the emergency services to really make the emergency services understood well what happened or allow them to accompany, uh, to, to let the midwife accompany her client to the hospital. And there is a big need to come good communication between midwife or emergency services and the hospital to understand what was the underlying situation. And what is also very important to really uh, transfer information and make the environment the most hospitable uh, possible. And I think the good thing is there are some guidelines for transfer and I really thank Sarasvati Vedam and her presentation in our ICM conference about the Home Birth Summit and the practice transfer uh, guidelines they made up. So my question is, do you have guidelines for transfer? Is it included in your profession, professional organization of the care? And also, which I find really, really important, is the evaluation uh, to do after the transfer, both for the situation, what could be avoided, also how the transfer could be handled or handled better, and also uh, do the evaluation for you as a professional and also the discussion with the, with the client. So please, uh, this is my final slide, uh, and please, I, I want to continue a bit the discussion about the, about the organization of transfers and the well-being of women and well-being of the midwives, which are included in the situation. read what you have written during the time. Oh, this is great, Yvonne. A lot of really good words to include in the, in the situation. Yes, yes. I also think so that we need really to enhance continuity of care. That is really much, much, much better for the woman uh, who knows her midwife to handle 
the, the situation easier and with more uh, with more calmness. And uh, this is uh, I really feel this is very important for the midwife to accompany the woman to the hospital and to uh, to be included in the in the care even in the hospital, which is quite complicated here. Some, some of the most famous home birth midwives are uh, literally forbidden to enter the door in, the, in some hospitals. Yeah, Linda, I think I think the UK UK situation is very very good and on the rise. I know even about the uh, NICE. Um, guidelines which included home birth as a best option for uh, multiparas, and so so if the situation is such, Linda, uh, there are also all the time are there are there these issues in communication between between midwives and the home birth transfers and the hospitals? Are the are the women told off for trying for home birth, or they really try to be polite and and helpful? Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, this is a good thing that you have referral guidelines. I think this is very important. Okay, thank you, Robin. Yes, I think it's really important. Yeah, Yvonne, I think it really depends on the on the team who is who is at service by the time. And it's a really sad thing that you have always count have to count on people uh, for 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 getting for getting the different types of care. But, Important thing is whether there is a there is a, a, a kind of standard, and of course some people can differ because of their personal feelings or or unprofessional behavior, and uh, so this can be tackled even by the and you can say okay, Mister, after the situation is finished, okay, you you behave that way, but uh, you should have behaved this way, and there is other. Other situations when there are no guidelines and they just can behave any way they want and uh, be not uh, really uh, facing discussions about it. Well, of course, yeah. The the discussion about guidelines is uh, is another thing, and I have plenty plenty of. Uh, Examples from here when the when the, the guidelines are just set without even any scientific uh, link to any scientific scientific study. It's just the guideline which is made up from from a, a historical point of view and still keeping their their ideas written down and practiced. I hear a lot of typing in my speakers. <laughs> I think it's Linda. Maybe Linda, you can unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. The yeah. Uh, there is a lot of scare even among women here. The tradition is the birth is very, uh, very hard and bloody and a lot of pain, and you have to uh, the the message which is given from mothers to to daughters is you have just to suffer and you have to stand everything what is done to you because the uh, it's because of the baby. But I think it's plus minus uh, same everywhere. There there is a this discontinuation of the childbirth and family life. Yes, Karen. I read a lot. I've read a lot about the about the situation in New Zealand and also in Australia, where women decide to go against against the guidelines, 
Yes. And so, so you are not as a, as a midwife uh, prosecuted to go outside the guidelines. You have to be uh, really well backed legally, I, I, I presume. Yeah, <laughs> and actually, this this now applies also to women who decide to do home birth, and I think this is very um, this is not a really good thing for women uh, who want to get good care to be strong and resilient. Because women, as we saw really nicely in the in the opening lecture, need to be uh, relaxed and not uh, not thinking. They have to be really just birthing. So it's. Uh, uh, it's counter. It's going against the the good, the good childbirth experience to be strong and resilient. And I, it's very, very important that the supporting people around the woman are strong and resilient in a system that is hostile. Yes, yeah, thank you, Karen. Yes, it's a it's a good. Good thing that you have the process set up. But yeah, the the scare is there, and the scare is uh, the scare of the of the professionals is everywhere. It's among the the medical doctors. It's among the midwives. And it's not really a good good setup for for a good home for good birth anywhere. And the the situation of the of the informed consent is also a big issue here. Uh, we have we have a law uh, saying that the the medical doctors can overcome the decision of uh, of parents concerning a baby. Uh, I think the medical doctors cannot overcome the decision of of a person itself, even if she decides to uh, to make harm to herself. But of course, sometimes it's done. But it can be legally done in case of, of of a child up to 18 years, and but the but the child has to be really in immediate need of life saving procedure, and it's but it's quite often misused by doctors out of fear that they don't recognize very well the situation, so they extend this uh, to the situation which are not immediately harmful for the baby. And around the birth, they are, uh, there is also an extra insecurity because they, they are not sure whether uh, the child is already a person and the law applies and they have to force the mother to, to sub, sub, submit, succumb to their decision or whether this is uh, really just the mother's decision. And so a lot of things and procedures in the hospitals are done unnecessarily just because of the well-being of the baby. And either they do it without consent or they really force the women to consent. And I'm really happy that at least in some countries, as you have written here, that there is a good support for midwives and good support for, uh, for even all other healthcare uh, workers that they really can communicate in a good way. So, so I, I'll be analyzing your chat afterwards, and thank you very much for, your, for all your input. OK. I think, I think any more questions, or shall we? How, how many minutes do we have? Like okay. one minute, yes. because we need to finish uh, 10 okay. minutes. Okay, so, so I hope you, you all uh, got some interesting things from the discussion and from the, the presentation. And I'll be posting the, the presentation and maybe some other links uh, onto, the, onto the conference Facebook so you can, you can get and uh, find for yourself the, the interesting things we, thought we, we are discussing. Thank you, Maketa. I think that was a really, really nice session. Thank you for being so interactive with all of us. I think um, Maketa deserves 
um, okay, thank applaud. you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking with you, all you, and uh, um, I hope I'll meet you some other day or on some conference or, or on Facebook or anywhere where people who are wishing for a good care for mothers and their babies meet. Yeah, thanks. I mean, the key I learned today from this session is basically the woman should be in the driving seat of the decision making. And um, and yes, there could be guidelines, yes. but it's actually the woman. Yes, who definitely. Should and decide. She has to be supported and very well informed. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so um, let's um, continue. Kiran, you want to? Um, yes, Ma uh, Michaela. You thank you. Finish the session. Um, overall, it was a wonderful session, and uh, uh, it, I could observe that uh, many participants participated in this, and we came to know that what are the uh, situation of emergency syst uh, system for women in different parts of the world. So thank you for generating uh, this uh, discussion and bringing this um, this thing uh, to the international conference marketer congratulations for your presentation and here we uh, end this presentation uh, we can now uh, stop the recording of the session